Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome everyone into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Everyone, welcome into the program. Today on the show, we have the one, the only, Mr. Ralph Bond. He'll be joining us. He is our science and tech trends correspondent. And of course, uh, yeah, he joins us every single Friday. You can set your clock to it where we talk about a number of stories that are obviously science and tech related. Uh, ones that you probably haven't heard of. I know that, um, you know, just look through them just now. And we definitely have not talked about them on the show this week. So, with that being said, let's go ahead and just introduce everything. Uh, ComputerAmerica.com, that's where you... Wow, I'm sorry. There we go. ComputerAmerica.com. That's where you'll find everything, including past shows, future shows, show notes, links to social media, articles, reviews, uh, giveaways, and all that good stuff. So ComputerAmerica.com. The show notes will have everything. Ralph very meticulously puts this together. And, you know, there's going to be links, videos, uh, everything you need to know will be in the show notes every single week. Uh, let's see. So there's that. Also, be sure to check out social media links and, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and just bring, oh, actually, real quick, a uh, a very appreciative shout out to all of the text messages alerting me that you have paid my AT&T bill for the month. Uh, I've gotten about 24 of you uh, who have paid my AT&T bill. Uh, I, I never click your links because they look like, uh, you know, scam, but uh, just thank you all out of the kindness of my heart that... Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, this is a joke. I'm getting inundated with with scam text messages that are like, "Hey, we just paid your AT and T bill. Just you know, click here." And I and I never click here, but it's crazy. So, with that being said, everyone, Ralph Bond, science and tech tech trends correspondent, and of course, longtime contributor here to Computer America. Ralph, how you been? I'm doing great. And hey, I'll pick up on something you're just talking about scams lately. Almost every day, I'm getting one or more of these emails saying, well, you haven't logged into your Outlook uh, email account, and, mm-hmm. and, and it's going to be suspended by this date if you don't log in and <laughs> click here. And, and I, how ridiculous. I probably use, I mean, all day long, I'm using that account yeah. day after day. And it said, it's going to be, you know, end by uh, 1st of July. Well, I obviously, that's not the case. You were able to send me the <laughs> links for the show. So, I mean, folks, be careful. Be yeah. so careful because these emails are very cleverly disguised. The sending email looks like a legit Microsoft address, so they're obviously able to cloak these things. Mm-hmm. Fortunately, when I examine it, you can see that the response is to some kind of weird Gmail account or something. It's what? And so be careful. Use the viewing pane if you're an Outlook user. Yeah. And I'm sure other email services do this too. You can click on an email without really opening it, but kind of view it and see, oh yeah, this is not good. And that's then a good you know, tip. put it in, and block it out and use your email service to block that sender. But they keep regenerating different oh, ways yeah. to get to you, but just be careful. So I, totally sympathize with what you're saying and it's so important to be careful gosh it's uh and, and you know uh, especially during the pandemic we we've, we've done stories lately uh-huh. that uh, over 2020 and 2021 like obviously everyone was at home everyone was trying to you know uh, not telecommute yep. but uh, work yeah. from home for the first time Ralph people clicked on scam links and spam links more in the last two years than they ever have before like it, it's it was rampant it. during the pandemic because people just didn't know you know hey yeah. it looks like a zoom link i'll click that and sure. you know yeah it's uh very very easy to uh get got like personally the only scam ralph and, and then we'll get into our stories i will say that the <laughs> only scam that i ever fell for <laughs> was uh I, I i was working a night shift uh at my old job and they called me and they're like there's a problem with your account um oh, you know no. your, your your card is about to be canceled and i'm like that's the only card uh. i have like i kind of need that and uh, it was like 3 a.m. And uh, mm. they're like, you know, call this number. 
I call the number automated. It's like, you know, we know some weird transactions. Uh, please verify mm-hmm. that this was your card by entering your card number. And I'm like, blah, 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 blah. And then please enter the digits on the back. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, no. And then, oh, like, no. I talked to my mom about it the next day. And she's like, you need to cancel that card and go get yourself a new one. Because, yeah, I just gave myself over to a scammer. Um, even when you think you're smart, Ralph, like, it's, yep. it, it, it just takes one moment of... Uh, you know, sure. who, who to thunk it. So yep. everyone be safe, but <laughs> we're here to uplift you, not put you down. Yes. For, yes. You know, p- for giving <laughs> no, no, no more downers. Number. <laughs> yes, exactly. So Ralph, let's, uh, <laughs> let's just introduce every, uh, everyone who this may be the first time. Uh, what kind of stories do you go for? Yeah. Well, uh, for example, today we're going to have everything from trash eating bugs to a mm-hmm. massive underwater system to generate electricity. But then I'll give you my standard spiel about who I am and what I do. Please do. I- I'm, an ag- I'm an aggregator of science and tech news features I find by monitoring a host of online news outlets. And I look for important and sometimes wild and wacky stories that don't usually capture mainstream press attention. And I'm always on the lookout for news that gives a glimpse into the where we're headed, for example, in robotics, medical technology, sustainable energy technology, transportation advances, space research, physics, <laughs> you name it. And what I do with each news item is present the essential high-level points in what I hope is a digestible form. And as you said at the outset, please, everybody, come out to ComputerAmerica.com. Get the show notes for today's episode because you can dig deeper. We're going to only do the highlights. If you really want to get into the science and technology, get the show notes and follow the links and get the pictures and all that good stuff. Yep. And dig deeper is a great way to put that, Ralph, because story number one, uh, something that uh, I think a lot of us, you know, maybe, uh, you know, you're kind of used to worms. Maybe you think they're icky and gross, but uh, it looks like the worms might actually have our backs on this one. Yes. Yes. Headline styrofoam eating super worm could help solve a huge worldwide garbage crisis. Picked up this story first from the Washington Post and from many other sources as well. And it's just like, what? So Mm -hmm. weird. Anyway, there's a video here you can show. And recently, scientists from the University of Queensland in Australia showed that the larva of the darkling beetle can survive solely on polystyrene, which is commonly called styrofoam. And by the way, I'm going to add some uh, bonus notes here. Uh, The larva are also known by the common name mealworms. So in the video here, as Mm. you're looking, uh, they may look familiar. And I remember, I think my son and I would go to the pet store and buy live mealworms, pardon me, if I could say that, (laughs) and feed it to his pet lizard, for example. So it's a very common uh, creature. And the research that the Queensland people are doing comes uh, amid a flurry of research recently on ways bacteria and other organisms can consume plastic materials like styrofoam and drinking bottles, the plastic drinking bottles. And um, by the way, another bonus nugget here, dar- darkling beady. Oh, well, let's try that again. Darkling beetles belong to a family of beetles found worldwide estimated to be more than two more than, get this, 20,000 species. What? And darkling beetles eat both fresh and decaying vegetation. But in this case, they're going after styrofoam. Well, back to the story here. The researchers plan to study the enzymes that allow the darkling beetle superworms to digest styrofoam. And their goal is to find a way to transform their research into a commercial product. And here's another bonus nugget. Uh, if you're going enzymes, I've heard of this. What, what is an enzyme? Okay, an enzyme is a biological catalyst and is almost always a protein. It speeds up the rate of a specific chemical reaction in the cell. The enzyme is not destroyed during the reaction and is used over and over again. Uh, a cell contains thousands of different types of enzyme molecules, each specific to a particular chemical reaction. So you can dig into the biology of what enzymes are. It's all about your digestion primarily. Mm -hmm. So going back to the story, if successful, industrial deployment of a natural enzyme-based treatment that they're going to create based on what the darkling uh, larva can do. Uh, So if you can get this natural enzyme-based treatment to dispose and recycle styrofoam, this would transform the way 
waste managers deal with a material that accounts for as much as, and I had no idea about this. So styrofoam accounts for as much as 30% of landfill space worldwide. Holy smoke. So there's hope on the way. Yeah, that that that's incredible, and and like you said, these are incredibly common animals. Um, you know, we mm-hmm. raise and grow them all the time. I do like the idea of you know, kind of removing the worm from the equation, just having like a chemical that you can send, right? Or right. you know, the, you, you you could just send the enzyme to treat this stuff. Um, right. Rob, and, and of course, you know, thirty percent of the space <laughs> is a big number, but to also yes. put it into another perspective that it, you know you can see right here in the article uh, somewhere out right there, fourteen million tons end up in the oceans every single year. And, uh, you know, you yes. can think styrofoam, it's pretty light. You know, it's not heavy at all. So 14 million tons end up Insane. in the water. So yeah, it's, uh, this and, is definitely and, solving an issue. Oh yeah. And Ben, I don't know about your experience as a consumer, but it's, I th- when I read this article, I thought, I, I said, you know, thinking about all the stuff I get from Amazon or different packaging products and so forth, I'm seeing less and less styrofoam used in packing uh, products that I buy in the last several years. I don't know if that's your experience too. I see more and more just kind of cardboard or or molded (laughs) paper-like stuff. Yeah, when when I get styrofoam peanuts, I get uh, very, very Mm. upset because they are the most annoying packing material to deal with. Um, Unfortunately, Ralph, it seems like uh, plastic, you know, those those little bags of air seem to have replaced styrofoam in a lot of cases. So, you know, more plastic. That's true. Um, And I think that a lot of people out there, you know... Because, you know, to dispose of styrofoam, you throw it away, it, you know, it, it doesn't shrink, it doesn't really do anything, and, you know, it takes 500 years for it to break down in a landfill. Um, <sighs> you know, this stuff is uh, bulky, you know, wasteful and all that kind of thing. But, yeah, if we have a way to safely dispose of it, maybe that, you know, maybe you'll see more styrofoam, Ralph, because, hey, yeah. there's a way to safely get rid of it. Um could be. Or at least to get rid of what's out there now. <laughs> yeah, that too. That too. So there you go. And that is definitely off our usual news beat, but it's very, very helpful because, hey, let's face it, you know, buy a pair, go, go to the store right now, buy a pair of speakers, almost guaranteed they're going to be in styrofoam. You know, it's um, by, by any computer part or any electronic and it's going to come with styrofoam. So, okay. So yeah. there's that one. Story number one, definitely different. Uh, Ralph, we have all these worms everywhere now. Story number two, let's get rid of them with some fish. Yeah, well, and it's kind of a closely related story when you talk about styrofoam and other plastics getting into our water, or, uh, the oceans and fresh water supply. This story really relates to that kind of a nice follow on. The headline here is scientists create bionic robotic fish to remove microplastics from the earth's oceans and our water supplies and i got this from the uk's guardian newspaper really a fun kind of a fun wild curious story yeah. <laughs> but here we go microplastics in our oceans and freshwater sources is one of the biggest environmental problems today i think everybody listening to this show goes yeah i know that and but again just to be sure everyone's on track here microplastics are the billions of tiny plastic particles which fragment from bigger plastic things such as water bottles, car tires, synthetic t-shirts, and of course, on and on and on, so many other plastic products, right? right? And a little more detail here I've added to the notes on the fly this morning before we got on together here. Uh, Microplastics are fragments of any type of plastic less than five millimeters or 0.20 inches in length. So that gives you an idea of the size of what we're talking about. Uh, Kind of interesting. Now, here's the problem. Here's why microplastics are ugh, a problem. They could have a damaging impact on aquatic and terrestrial life with their ability to absorb toxic chemicals and then release them in an animal's digestive system, including this animal right here. Yeah, humans. <laughs> now, to the story. To combat microplastics, Scientists at the Polymer Research Institute of Sichuan University in China recently announced a remarkable new weapon in this war against microplastics. They created a tiny robot fish that can remove microplastics from the Earth's oceans and freshwater bodies by swimming around and absorbing them on its soft, flexible body. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. 
And get this, measuring only about one half inch in length. I mean, we're talking tiny. The tiny self-propelled robofish can swim around, latch onto free-floating microplastics, and even self-heal its synthetic body if it gets Mm. cut or damaged. Another interesting nugget, it uses a light-activated propulsion system in its tail Uh, So with that system, the robofish can swim at a speed of about 1.2 inches a a (laughs) second. And that's similar to the speed of which plankton drift around in moving water, by the way. (laughs) Hmm. And then here's here's a little bit about how this all works. So here's how the Szechuan University robofish can absorb nearby free-floating bits of microplastics. Here's how it works. The organic dyes and heavy metals in the microplastics have strong chemical bonds that cause an electrostatic interaction that attracts them to the materials that make up the robofish's body. So that's how it works. Good old electro, electrostatic. <laughs> right. But time for a reality check. In fairness, the Szechuan University team itself stressed that it's just a proof of concept and much more research is needed. And maybe you've been thinking this all along as I've been giving out the story too, Ben. Mm. First, my take on this, first, you would need trillions upon trillions of these tiny robot fish to significantly tackle the challenge (laughs) of microplastics in our oceans and fresh water sources, right? And then another thought is, okay, you deploy, let's say you could deploy countless trillions of these things and they're out there doing their thing. How do you Mm -hmm. collect these guys once they've done their job? And how do you process and dispose of them or whatever, right? But but not to be a a downer Debbie here, I still give this idea an A plus for creativity. (laughs) It's just such a curious idea. (laughs) That's actually the cool part. The the, the fish actually break down into microplastics. So, you know, uh, when they're done with their job, they actually break down into microplastics and you don't even see them anymore. It's very, very cool. Uh, oh, okay. God, that's great. Thank you. That was, yeah. that, that, uh, by the way, that was a complete joke. The, the the fish to collect microplastics do not break down into microplastics. I hope not. Well, I was going to say uh, that would be good. <laughs> yes, that would defeat the whole purpose. But no, uh, yeah. and, and for a lot of people out there wondering how big of a problem, like I, I know that it's not, you know, like the daily thing that people worry right. about anymore. But Ralph, I'm sure you living on, uh, you know, on the West Coast know this about the uh, the Pacific garbage patch and I think that oh, a lot of you know yes. yeah that, that used to be a, a big topic of conversation um, it's not even so much like you know a big island of garbage and you know you may still find patches of floating garbage but it's more just a giant area the size of like you know, Texas. That's just yeah. That's or, or, right. I think I heard it was the size of Texas. Right. Yeah. It, yeah. It's like the size of Texas, and it looks like just open blue water, but it's in actuality, it's just littered. It's just inundated yep. with microplastics. So, yeah, yep. that's the kind of problem that they're trying to solve. Yeah. And any solution, yeah. uh, especially fish based, is uh, you know, is pretty cool. Uh, to your to your questions, um, I, I mean, <laughs> you know, just the first one, how to collect them. I will say, Ralph, it sounds a lot easier to collect. Uh, half inch little fish than it does to collect uh, tiny, tiny, tiny microplastics. So maybe a giant net, maybe they're programmed to kind of float up to the top when they're spent. I don't know what it could be, but yeah, well, it's you a know, possible you, solution. And, and I didn't see anything in the articles I looked at on this topic that explained what, what happens after they're deployed. Mm-hmm. So when you first did your joke about they they break down, and I, I thought, oh, did I miss something at first? You got <laughs> no, me. No, 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 no. <laughs> No, no, no. That that was a complete joke. I'm sorry. I, I should not have said that. No, so that's okay. straight faced. I probably let's see. Ooh, I have something for this. I probably should have followed it up with a, but I didn't. So um, there you go. So uh, everyone, that was story number two, and uh, really ju- ju- just a, a an off the wall kind of idea. But it goes to show that you know there are universities all over the world that yes. are looking yes. at our problems and they have some of the smartest people trying to solve them so oh, there's boy, hope yeah. there's hope for all of this uh, definitely yep. so story number 2 story number 3 let's uh, yes. let's go a little bit different here and solve another problem and yes. you know this is a uh, Rob I I can't even imagine this because when I think about steel manufacturing I always think like you know the pits of hell the giant yes. moving vats of it's just a very yes. pre-industrial it's a very chaotic kind of thing I can't imagine doing this uh you know more efficiently so story number 3 was well, surprising to me Right and and friends 
this is a snarky comment on my part, but when you hear the story, just give it a few years and the Supreme Court will figure out some way to, uh, <laughs> you know, curb this wonderful innovation. But with that said, I don't want to be negative. That's right. This is all supposed to be up positive, today. positive. All right, here we go. Headline. Now there's a new steel manufacturing technology that does not rely on fossil fuels. I got this from ArsTechnica.com. And you can see the image here of a, t- a traditional blast furnace, but let's get into the story here. More than two billion with a B tons of steel are produced annually worldwide. But here's the problem. Steel making accounts for seven to 11% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Wait a minute, seven to 11%. Wow. Making it one of the largest industrial sources of atmospheric pollution. And here's why. Most steel is made using a process that involves extracting iron from its ores using a coke smelting process in a blast furnace. And the coke used in the smelting process is produced by heating coal, of course, a fossil fuel, at high temperatures. And then this coke is used to fuel a blast furnace to make steel by chemically reducing and physically converting iron oxides into liquid iron, which is called hot metal. All right. So the bottom line is it's all a very climate unfriendly fossil fuel based process. As Ben, you were alluding to, it's something that's kind of been unchanged for what, a hundred and some odd Mm -hmm. years or whatever. Um, Brutal industrial stuff. But now time for the uplifting good news. Boston Metal, an outfit called Boston Metal, which is a spinoff from, guess what, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Yep. Recently, they recently revealed a game-changing alternative to traditional coke fuel-based blast furnaces. They created an electrolysis process for making steel that uses electricity instead to separate iron from its ores. And electrolysis, by the way, is an electrochemical process that uses direct electric current to separate chemical compounds into their constituent parts. Wow. So with its new electrolysis process, Boston Metal claims it can make steel without releasing carbon dioxide, helping to clean up one of the world's worst industries for greenhouse gas emissions. Wow. I mean, if this gets deployed, if it's commercially viable in terms of cost and so on and so forth, and if the electricity that's used in this process, Ben, is coming from renewable sources, wind, solar, water, whatever the case may be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Wow, this could be a formula for a really better world when you think 7 to 11% of greenhouse gas emissions coming from making steel alone. That's a huge, huge chunk of the problem. Yeah, it, it, it's, it just takes so much energy and heat and just to melt it all yep. down, yeah. scrape away the stuff on top, scrape away the slag, get the liquid metal. And of course, all this, yep. you have to keep it at, you know, 15, 2000 degrees, whatever it may be. Oh, yeah. uh, Ralph, if you can just do this chemically with electricity, I mean, you're, you're cutting out so much of that. Now, you know, of course, that electricity is going to have to come from somewhere. And, you know, let's right. face it, they're already burning fuel to do the initial part. It's just, man, it's such a better solution that I think, you know, 100 and 150 years ago, they didn't even know about. And now we can no, finally right. maybe turn this around and scale it up and it'll be something very, very cool. So, yeah. everyone, uh, if you've been watching the video portion, we were checking out their their uh, their product videos, and of course, there's a link to uh, Boston Metal there in uh, yeah. in the Ars Technica article as well. But very very cool, and like you said, Ralph, uh, sh- you know, shoot off of uh, of MIT Yay. just goes to show just how you're right. Um, you know, they have smart people working there, but what they do better than I think a lot of other universities is that they actually you know start businesses and try to start. Uh, yes. making these things commercially viable. And that's something that yep. MIT excels at. Yes, absolutely. So there you go. Uh, story number three, our final one, story number four, we're going back to the water. And <laughs> this one is, you know, uh, so much of technology, uh, like, like the first thing that you learn with technology as a human is 
electricity and water don't mix. And, <laughs> you know, growing up in Florida, Ralph, and of course you're, you know, you're near our coast too. Uh, whenever a friend drops a phone in the ocean, oh. you're like, that phone is toast. You just got to get another one. Salt water is so bad for electronics. It's just awful. Uh, so I always find it, you know, kind of ironic that we're turning to the ocean. I mean, just about a year ago, Ralph, we did a story, I think it was you, um, where uh, Microsoft was putting their servers underwater because, you know, uh, yeah, right. <clears throat> because, the, you know, servers get super hot and, yes. you know, the temperatures of the deep, deep ocean keep it much, much cooler. And it was very energy right. efficient because you didn't have to spend anything. Uh, yeah. I always love it, Ralph, when we turn to the ocean to help with technology because they're so anti one another so story number four it is ironic yeah so here's the headline for this story new world's largest underwater turbine generates electricity using deep ocean currents and i picked this story up first from futurism.com and then also some supplementary research in a bloomberg story and once again the show notes folks have the links pictures everything here please get up get the show notes if you want to dig deeper and uh, ben you're showing the picture of this huge right. thing <laughs> but let's get into this the idea of using ocean power to generate electricity it's not new. That's not what we're saying here. For years, we've had research and deployment of ocean wave, tidal, and ocean current electricity generating solutions. Now, just as a little sidebar, which I added this morning uh, before we got on the phone together here or on the uh, connection together, the possible use of marine currents as an energy resource began to draw attention in the mid 1970s after the first oil crisis, and I'm an old enough guy to remember that very mm -hmm. clearly. In 1974, several conceptual designs were presented at the MacArthur Workshop on Energy, and in the 1976, the British General Electric Company undertook a partially government-funded study, which concluded that marine current power deserved more detailed research. Well, sure did. Here we are all these many years later. So going back to our story, although this device or this system is not the world's first ocean current generating solution. Uh, this new uh, ocean current based generating solution, to repeat myself, from a heavy machinery outfit in Japan called IHI Corporation, it grabbed my attention, Ben, because of its remarkable size. The recently tested prototype, and again, viewers of this show can see the picture, it's mm -hmm. a massive 330 ton, 330 ton underwater system measuring about 66 feet long and 66 feet wide oh it <laughs> looks like in the picture ralph it, it it looks like three individual pods but i see now that they, right. they're connected with those um, you know with those arms between them this exactly is all one unit that's incredible yeah it is and if if you're not able to see the picture as we're speaking here. Let me give you a quick visual. This giant machine somewhat resembles a passenger jet airplane with two jet engines, so to speak. And the central tube-shaped fuselage houses a buoyancy adjustment system. Once anchored to the sea floor, the center buoyancy unit enables the entire three-part system to hover between mm. 100 and 160 feet below the surface to capture strong ocean currents. And on the underside of the central flotation unit is a crossbar, which you can see in the picture if you have that in front of you, that connects the cylindrical shaped turbine units, one on the left, one on the right, which would be in the analogy to the engines of a jet airplane, right? <laughs> Each turbine unit measures about 36 feet in diameter and contains powerful counter-rotating turbine fans to generate electricity from ocean currents. Now, IHI Corporation's recent first successful test was conducted off the eastern coast of Japan to take advantage of very powerful currents present in that area. Mm -hmm. And IHI Corp's ultimate goal is to deploy numerous systems in the Kuroshio, I hope I'm saying that right, current off eastern Japan to generate as much as 200 gigawatts, which would equal about 60% of Japan's present generating capacity. With And they have plans to kick off commercial operations in the next decade. So how great is this? And you know, one of the things that was pointed out in the article as well that I didn't mention 
is, you know, solar's great, wind's great, but they're weather dependent in a way, right? right? Ocean currents are just this kind of wonderful constant source of uh, potential energy generation. So that's another reason why this is so exciting. And if you could deploy these things without messing up the environment and not messing up shipping lanes and whatever the case may be, right. we could have hundreds, thousands of these things. Wow. What a great way to generate electricity in a constant, consistent, and reliable way. For sure. It, it, it's, it's uh, you know, the fact that it hovers, it doesn't settle on the ground, potentially damaging, you know, uh, any kind of uh, ecosystems that may be down there. Uh, hopefully yeah. it doesn't generate too much sound, you know, so that whatever wildlife no, that's is a good in the point. area, yeah. uh, you know, doesn't get affected Ralph, because I know that's a problem with like whales and stuff and, you know, the very yeah, sensitive that's to sound. True. Um, but I, I doubt that would be the case. Uh, let's face it, Ralph, I mean, cur- ocean currents are just solar in another form, you know, just like wind is, a, is solar in another form. It's just the heat from the sun moving the ocean currents, going from hot to cold areas. Um, it's constant. It's very, very powerful. And if we can harvest that, I mean, hey, 60% of Japan's current, pa- uh, you know, uh, power generating uh, potential That is, you know, that's a lot of energy just for something that people won't have to see, people won't have to deal with. It'll be low enough. This is this is so great. Yeah, I think that whole field of ocean current electrical generation, which again, want to stress, folks, we're not talking about the very first in the world, but the biggest so far. (laughs) Yeah, no, no, no. This thing is definitely huge. So, Ralph, I think with that, uh, there's of course, um, you know, some more details there in the show notes that you should definitely check out computeramerica.com. And everyone will have this up on YouTube. And on top of that, we'll have a link to Ralph's site where if you want more Ralph, hey, these stories, as we always say, they're, uh, you know, they're timeless they're, because they're cutting edge. They're so cutting edge. They're research. They're coming out. They're just getting deployed. Hey, his shows are always relevant for years to come. Ralph, thank you so much for coming back onto the program. And everyone else, we hope you have a great weekend. You do something fun. You try to keep your mind off of the news. And hey, you do something for your yourself um you know go out there and make yourself happy so ralph thank you again and everyone see you here next time computeramerica.com bye everyone